Um, so this is a, an area of research that we sort of backed into, um, and it'll have two parts, the antiviral part and then the post mutagenesis part, which represents the two edged sword. Uh, but it has to do with the question of lethal mutagenesis as an antiviral strategy. So I'd like to spend a few minutes reminding everybody what, what it is. Uh, I think it's a broad interest to virologists just because it's a kind of a unique genetic approach to an antiviral. So this is something that uh, just to remind everybody that kind of the what happens if you get infected with SARS-CoV-2, but to make the point, let's see if I can make that point, to make the point that if we, it, it seems clear that the antivirals are not gonna do very well once somebody has progressed into hospitalization. Um, so we're really looking to treat people uh, earlier in the infection. And most people who are asymptomatic unless they know that they've had an exposure are not gonna be very good candidates uh, for an antiviral just because they don't know they're infected. So we're really talking about a population of people who are becoming symptomatic, which is actually, you know, looks like it's a majority of the people who get infected. Um, and then a fraction of them will progress to hospitalization and potentially death or long COVID. Um, and so this is where the antivirals could have an effect. And uh, we should keep that in mind that the only a fraction of the people who are symptomatic, and it's of course linked to risk factors, would progress to hospitalization. You'll see that at the end as a, a concern with what a, an antiviral could do. If you had a very benign antiviral, you, know, you could do test and treat basically, and even do prep with it. If you have an antiviral where you're concerned about side effects, then you'd wanna focus it more on symptomatic people and understand that a lot of people who get exposed to the antiviral, in fact, would have resolved the, the infection anyway. Uh, this Lauren's talk again is a, brings out the point that different types of drugs that we would use in an epidemic or a pandemic will take different amounts of time to become available for the next epidemic. Now, I'm gonna show you why I think this is true, but the strategy of lethal mutagenesis is available for any RNA virus, any RNA virus, especially one that's growing quickly, it's ready to go. It's a drug that will work, I think, against any RNA virus. Uh, there's some folks up in New York have, the, those of you who are in the HIV field will recognize the drug that's called T20. Uh, it blocks entry by blocking the formation of the six helix bundle and the transmembrane protein. But they've described a delivery system where you anchor a peptide that interferes with the six helix bundle formation. Uh, that gets anchored in the membrane and can be delivered uh, as an aerosol. So it goes into the lungs. It can get into the endosome where fusion occurs with this virus. And so once you know the sequence of the virus, it's easy to identify the, six, the helical repeats one and two that form the six helix bundle. So it's easy to, to develop this type of a peptide. The delivery system is in place. So a drug based on a type one fusion entry mechanism or type one like our surface protein uh, could be developed really quickly because you just have to change the sequence of the, uh, the peptide. Nucleoside chain terminators uh, are soon to be, there, there are lots of them sitting on the shelf and I have to do is screen the ones that'll work against the virus. Um, if we had some experience in humans that would make it all that much faster. Uh, you can see the timeline that we saw for monoclonal antibodies. Um, that is a, just an amazing technology that has evolved incredibly fast. And so as soon as you start to get a few infected people, you can start developing an antibody. Let's, let's call it on a year if your basis for production. Uh, it would be nice if we had broadly, these broadly neutralizing antibodies that could be tested against the, the next virus and made available even faster. And then direct acting antivirals, which I'll say are dis, I would kind of classify as distinct from a lethal mutagenesis strategy, something that actually is designed to work against a virus. And we just saw the, what I would argue is the first one coming out um, from Pfizer the other day, but here we are almost two years into the epidemic and that is just going to the, the FDA now. So this is kind of the timeline of how long it takes to develop starting from scratch, the next generation of inhibitors or treatments. And again, lethal mutagenesis just by its mechanism fits in well with those strategies if we can get it to understand how it works well enough. 
And this is the original kind of de demonstration of lethal mutagenesis. The idea came out in the 90s. Um, this was with a, an early drug called ribavirin. So what ribavirin is, is a normal sugar, ribose, two prime and three prime um, OHs. And this is the analog of the, the um, purine base. And you can see it's, not, it's a pretty weird purine analog. But the whole trick of it is to rotate around this bond right here so that you swap the position of a hydrogen acceptor and a hydrogen donor. And that's the basis for base pairing. And so as you rotate around this bond, these two guys change positions and they'll pair with either guanine, or I'm sorry, with, with the, as guanine or as adenine as the base analog. Um, this is a drug called pavipiravir. And you can see that it's now a six membered ring, a little bit different, but the business end is still the same. So favipiravir is actually, to my mind, basically the same thing as ribavirin. Turns out neither one of them is very good. I don't think they're metabolized very well. Uh, so they'll, they'll pop up in the talk once in a while, but they're quite distinct from molnupiravir, which I think is just way more potent. And then of course, as I mentioned, the mechanism of action here is to rotate around this bond. And you can see that's the same for both ribavirin and favipiravir. So this is, uh, well, this is called N-hydroxycytidine or NHC. It's the original drug. We know about this type of a molecule for a long time. It is cytidine, except it has this OH here. This is formed when you take a small molecule hydroxylamine and you treat DNA. You wind up with N-hydroxycytidine in the DNA form. It is mutagenic in DNA. We've known that since the 1960s. The mechanism of mutagenicity has been known for a the 70s. So the history of this drug is, is a long one, and our understanding of its ability to be mutagenic is also a long one, and I'll show you what that mechanism is in a second. And you can see that the only difference between cytidine and anhydroxycytidine is this extra oxygen. So unlike ribavirin and favipiravir, which are very strange base analogs, this one's pretty easy. What makes it, I think, even sneakier is that you'll remember that uh, uridine at this position is a carbonyl. So you have a biochemistry in the cell going on that accepts either an amine or a carbonyl at this position in coming off the base. And I would argue that that means that there's not a great deal of uh, chemical recognition other than base pairing at this point in terms of metabolism. So changing it to an OH from an H potentially is not a big deal for the cell and allows in theory, rapid metabolism of this molecule, which would go along with its potency. Now, what molnupiravir is, is the same thing. Here's NHC. It's got an ester that's been added off of the five prime OH. And that's just to let it get through the first round of cells in the epithelium of the gut. So it doesn't get phosphorylated in those cells and get stuck in those cells, gets into the blood, the ester gets removed, and then you just have NHC in the blood. So that was the step from NHC and DNA to a ribonucleoside, which was done in about 2003 by Raymond Shinazi. Many people have shown it's antiviral. And then going from NHC to molnupiravir, which is just to get it into the bloodstream. And then also that makes it a pill. So you can write a prescription, send people home, they can treat themselves. So here's how NHC works. So this is the normal base pairing for cytidine, hydrogen donor, hydrogen acceptor, um, uridine and adenosine, hydrogen acceptor, hydrogen donor. And um, so what you see with NHC is this oxygen here still allows hydrogen donor, hydrogen acceptor, just like cytidine, but it will also cause this hydrogen that's right here to migrate to the ring nitrogen. So now you've changed hydrogen acceptor, hydrogen donor, and it allows pairing with adenosine. So it's called the tautomeric shift. So it just kind of just goes back and forth and um, spends a certain amount of time as one or the other. And so the trick is if you get incorporated being read as 
about cytidine, and the next time you read as uridine, you've incorporated a mutation. And it, again, it just is a small chemical change in the molecule that just sits there and, and jumps back and forth between these two forms. So I see this in terms of the sort of the biochemistry as a really an incredibly small change, to about the smallest change you could make to a base and causing a profound change in its ability to base pair. So it's a, in some ways, it seems to me the optimal molecule to do uh, genetic manipulation of a viral genome through this type of lethal mutagenesis mechanism. So why does lethal mutagenesis work? Well, viruses have really small genomes. Uh, and you know, to all of these things that don't have introns, the density of genes is proportional to the size of the genome. And so viruses are down here. And there's about one gene for 1,000 base pairs through all of these non-intron containing organisms, including viruses. And as all of you know, viruses have such densely packed genomes that they frequently have overlapping genes. So if you have a mutation in a genome, there's a good chance it's gonna line, wind up in a, uh, in a gene. And the other side of that is that viruses live sort of on the edge of the uh, mutation rate that's almost deleterious, or they allow mutations to occur based on the size of the genome, suggesting that the rate of accumulation of mutations uh, is near the edge of what is tolerable for that size of the genome. The smaller the genome, the higher the mutation rate. The reality is that um, we cite these high mutation rates. It's really about one mutation for every two or three genomes. So on a per genome basis, you make plenty of good genomes, but that's the diversity that the virus uses to evolve under changing selective pressure. So the idea of lethal mutagenesis is just to, to nudge this mutation rate up a little bit beyond what the virus can deal with and uh, allow it to accumulate enough mutations that it becomes genetically uh, inoperable as an organism. So how do you get NHC or any of these things into the pool? So cells can't take up the triphosphate. So you give NHC as a ribonucleoside, ribavirin as a ribonucleoside, favipiravir as the base analog, which then gets uh, the ribose added. So the kind of the common place for the synthesis of purines and pyrimidines in the cell, and then the, the addition of these ribonucleoside analogs is at the monophosphate, the ribonucleoside monophosphate which gets phosphorylated to the diphosphate. The triphosphate becomes a substrate for RNA polymerase, for any RNA polymerase, cellular RNA, um, or in the case of a viral infection, viral RNA. And the trick, the nice thing that happens with lethal mutagenesis is these cellular RNAs pass through the ribonucleotide pool once. And they do get incorporation uh, that can get, these drugs are toxic to the cell, especially NHC, you can see it in cellular RNA at a low level. Uh, presumably the toxicity uh, is related to something like mispairing of tRNAs, making proteins that don't fold properly. It's a reversible mutagenesis or reversible toxicity, the, the short-term kind of acute toxicity. Um, but the virus, now the virus lives in this ribonucleotide pool. And so as it synthesizes its plus and minus strands, it's accumulating the analogs over and over again. So lethal mutagenesis really concentrates the mutagen in viral RNA. And so that's why it works. So here's our data with SARS-CoV-2. Um, this is done in uh, Mark Heise's lab. And you can see that NHC, nice and potent with NEC50, about 0.3. Here's ribavirin and favipiravir. You can wonder, you know, these drug levels are so high that you just can't, attain them in vivo. I have questions. Many of you will recognize the name ribavirin and some of you will recognize the name of favipiravir. I question whether they have really any clinical benefit in vivo, at least as an antiviral in lethal mutagenesis. These are just really high drug levels that you'd have to get. And then the correlate is we were able to sequence RNA with a really high accuracy using a unique molecular identifiers, and so we can actually see the incorporation. Uh, we don't see much, in, at least in this gene, in this target, right at the EC50, but once you get above the EC50, we can easily see the incorporation of mutations in the viral genome. And here you can see, we out here, we pick up a little bit of a signal from ribavirin, 
that would be antiviral if you could reach those drug levels. Uh, and the, the demonstration that this works in vivo. So here's, this was done in the Barrick lab, um, treating mice with molnupiravir. So this was actually the oral dosing of mice uh, with MERS. Uh, and so you can see if you give it early enough, you can pres preserve weight. If you give it late, it's not effective. Um, it's kind of an accelerated disease model. So uh, the idea is right, but the, the timing isn't quite the same as in humans. The other thing you see is that even under conditions where you're, you're getting disease progression, you can't recover infectious virus, even though the viral genomes are there. So that speaks to the mechanism of lethal mutagenesis that you're making viral genomes that ultimately the ones that are being shed in the lungs are not infectious, um, even though there are virus particles there with RNA in them. And then the other part of that is as in a dose dependent way, um, we can see mutations in the, uh, the earlier the dosing, we can see mutations in the viral genomes that are present in the lung tissue. The other thing that uh, it's worth paying attention to is, this is a study from uh, George and Wendy Painter that was published a few months ago, and that is dosing in humans of now molnupiravir. And this blue line here is the relevant one. It's the dose that people get. And um, we can do the arithmetic here. This concentration turns out to be about a Cmax of 10 micromolar in the blood. I just showed you an EC50 of 0.3 micromolar, at least in these liver cells that have been engineered to express the receptor. And so this level of drug in the blood, it seems to be adequate. The other thing is that the Cmax is, is not out of line with what we've seen with a lot of experience with the AIDS nucleoside analogs that are chain terminators. So in the dosing, 800 milligrams twice a day is a, maybe a little bit higher than we give for HIV nucleosides, but antivirals, um, but it's sort of in the same ballpark. So all of this seems to be familiar in that you can give a nucleoside analog, you can get reasonable levels in the blood. And so the question is, is it the potency enough to make it worthwhile? And, I think in this case, the, the answer is yes. And then this was a summer camp for faculty. I get to go out to RML in Hamilton, Montana. It's an NIH facility and uh, do actually get back to the bench. So this summer was lacrosse virus uh, playing around with NHC. So a very different virus, a bunya virus. And there's a large literature about NHC uh, being broadly antiviral. So this is just the case of doing it with another very different virus, but you can see in in Vero cells, a similar reasonable um, EC50. And then we were trying some different neuronal cells because uh, when you have this lacrosse virus ultimately causes encephalitis. And you can see that the EC50 looks like it changes in some of the cells. And maybe that's a cautionary note that whatever your target cell is gonna be, you have to think about the metabolism of these things, taking them up, what's the, the salvage pathway for the kinase are especially in the case of ribavirin and favipiravir, are those enzymes around to metabolize them to an active form in the target cells that you want them to be active in. So that's the first half of the story. And now there's the other half. So this is what I showed you a second ago. Um, ribonucleotides wind up as the monophosphate, diphosphate, triphosphate, polymerization. Here's the problem. We make our DNA precursors out of the ribonucleotide pool. The ribonucleoside diphosphate is the substrate for an enzyme called ribonucleotide reductase. It, it happens in all of life. Every piece of DNA in your body came from a DNA precursor that came out of the ribonucleotide pool and went into the deoxyribonucleotide pool. For those of you who like to think about uh, an RNA world, it's fun to think, oh yeah, we had this all set up for ribonucleotides and then added this pathway for deoxyribonucleotides. In any event, something that gets into the ribonucleotide diphosphate form on this biosynthetic pathway into RNA, just you can open any textbook, any biochemistry textbook, and you'll see this pathway. So we just tested this idea, and you can see that it's not, if you open a textbook, it's not a really very profound idea. Um, it's actually known from the 1950s that you can add 
a radio label ribonucleoside and find it in DNA. So and this is a this is how life works. And so we went ahead and did that experiment um, to see if we could see mutagenesis in DNA after dosing cells with uh, NHC as the ribonucleoside. We needed a genetic system. So this is to me this is one of the fun things of science. Um, so this is a paper that uh, Steve published in 1985. And I carried it around somehow in some way in the back of my head for 35 years. Because the only thing I could think of was when I needed a selection system in mammalian cells was, what was that experiment Steve did all that time ago? So we looked it up and it was a very robust, useful system back then and I think it's still true. So you use this enzyme called hypoxanthine phosphoribosol transferase, HPRT, and all it does is it adds the ribose to rescue purine bases. And so the, you can do guanine. Here's the, the ribose form that you add to it. It's, it's actually a, a fun metabolic pathway to look at if, if you get interested in metabolic pathways. Um, but it's just rescuing this to the monophosphate. Uh, and so you can make uh, GMP. The selection system has to do with a, an analog called 6-thioguanine. If you form 6-thioguanine GMP, either this or its metabolites further on are toxic to cells to the extent that they will kill cells. So you can look for the presence of HPRT activity as a way to kill cells or the knockout of HPRT activity as a way to allow cells to survive in this presence of 6-thioguanine. So that's the selection system. The experiment Steve did all those years ago was to just pop down a uh, an integration event of murine leukemia virus into HPRT, and he was able to identify specific integrants using the same assay. So this is what it looks like. You gross, you take cells, you actually uh, can en enrich them for ones that have HPRT just because it's a kind of a rapidly growing cell line. So there'll be some mutants in there. And then you just grow them in the presence of your mutagen for however long we, we actually chose 32 days and then take that off and add six thioguanine and wait a couple of weeks and all the cells clear except for the little colonies that are left and you count them and ask are there, is there a difference between uh, the control and the treated. And so this is our experiment. We actually did it twice before we published it. Um, and what you see is that in the presence of three micromolar NHC grown for a month, you can see a nice dose, well, a, do, a dose response at concentrations up to three micromolar. Uh, show you how sophisticated we were. We wanted a positive control, so we held a flask over the UV light box that we look at DNA with for kind of a short, unspecified period of time, and that was enough to give us positives. You can see the negatives are a little high because in this experiment, we didn't pre-cleanse the culture of HPRT mutants that were in there. But again, pretty easy signal to see of our colleagues said, oh, this AIDS drugs are mutagenic. We give them all the time. So next time we did it, we included some of the favorite AIDS drugs, which had no signal. Um, you can see we cleansed the culture. So the background went down, didn't do quite the same dose response, but got a signal, maybe a little bit of a signal for favipiravir, um, but not much. So that's the evidence that you can add a ribonucleoside that is a mutagen and into a cell that's dividing and cause mutagenesis uh, by getting metabolized into the DNA pool. So where are we today? So Merck eventually uh, along the way bought the rights to Molnupiravir from a company called Ridgeback that bought it from uh, George Painter out of Emory and they're going crazy with it. They're gonna run it, roll it out around the world uh, made deals with 100 companies, negotiated with the FDA, um, or not the FDA, with uh, the World Health Organization. It's Molnupiravir is now approved in the UK. It's a five-day dose at 800 milligrams twice a day. Uh, there's uh, a meeting in the FDA just in... Uh, in two minutes, Ron. Okay, in two, in two weeks um, to decide what, whether to give an emergency use authorization in the US. It doesn't work if people are hospitalized reduces symptomatic hospitalization in symptomatic people with risk factors by 50%, which is good, 
but that's a drop of 14% to 7%. So that means you have to treat 14 people to get one, have one person have a benefit. So 90% of the people who will be treated, even if they're symptomatic and in a risk group, will have no benefit, but they will have the exposure. So there've been two animal models that have been used to, to show that uh, it's not mutagenic in these animal models. Uh, so my stance is if you have an assay that doesn't show that a mutagen is a mutagen, is it that it's suddenly not a mutagen or that the assay wasn't sensitive enough? So these are the assays that are kind of available and I'm not gonna go through them, but let me raise the problem, the really the ultimate problem. If we have negative data, so this is a probability of getting a new cancer after exposure to environmental mutagens of one kind or another. And often this is shown kind of as age because over time we, generate mutagens or mutations and ultimately our risk for cancer goes up. So if our, if our assays are down here and we say we have negative data and we're in a range where we're adding mutations that don't significantly contribute to cancer, that's great. This is, would be where we are with you know, dental x-rays or those of us who used to do experiments with radioactivity, hopefully we're down here. And so the negative data would mean that that's good because if there was something bad going on, we would have the sensitivity to detect it. Problem is we don't know if the assays we have, these assays over here, I would argue, we don't know, they might be up here. It might be that we have to see such a high density of mutations with these assays that we're already in the range where it would be causing cancer later in life uh, and negative data would then pretty much be meaningless because uh, it would already be in a range where we should be of concern. And I would argue, we don't know where we are with molnupiravir. So what should we do? I would argue we should be brave and say, well, what's an acceptable cancer rate? If, if we're gonna acknowledge that it could cause cancer, what's an acceptable rate? Would it be greater than what the drug saves? That'd be a pretty high number. Would you say we wanna be risk averse and make it a really big number? Should we tie it to normal cancer rates? I don't know, but we should be brave and say what would be acceptable and then take a cohort of treated people and follow them and make sure that we're giving a drug where the side effects are acceptable. So that's it. Shantai Zhao and Colin Hill do all the work in my lab at UNC. We had a number of collaborators that allowed us to work with all these different viruses and, and Raymond Shinazi has been a, a close collaborator and intellectual guide in all of this work. So thank you very much. Well, thanks Ron for a fascinating uh, talk. And uh, what, what's been the response of uh, Merck to your uh, data? Um, well, the first, we told them about, about our results right away, uh, almost a year and a half ago. And they just wanted to know when it was gonna get funded or not funded, published. Um, and it's been to disc to not discredit, I don't think anyone disagrees with the experiment, but I'd say minimize it because their negative data uh, in the animals is what they're going with. And um, so it's been to you know, kind of marginalize our work, which, you know, which is fine. Um, ours is, we don't have the perfect experiment, but if you just want a proof of concept that this pathway is operational, I think we provided it. Uh, David, you can unmute yourself. Yes, uh, Ron, uh, this is David Ho. Uh, hey, David. <laughs> good to see you and, and nice talk uh, and good data. Uh, we, you know, Steve and I and others uh, at Columbia have been quite concerned about the same issue. And it's nice to see your results. Uh, and now given that the Pfizer drug and some of the monoclonal antibodies reduce uh, illness by close to 90% as opposed to the 50% uh, for the Merck drug. Uh, if you were ill, would you take it? If, if, I, if, I, could, if I was in a place, um, so, so the answer is yes. Would I rather take the, the Pfizer protease inhibitor? Absolutely. If I could get monoclonal antibodies, yes, I would take that first. Um, but I would take it, but I would want to be part of a cohort where we figured out how to use this drug because there's going to be another virus where we can roll this out on day one, but we really have to understand what its long-term effects are. And if we're gonna use it now, let's, let's create that cohort and find out what it means. And I think the other thing that I'm interested in is trying to 
I'm not the one to do it, but try to find comparable molecules. I think the mechanism is great. It's su such a, a simple chemical change. If we could just keep it out of the DNA metabolism pool, not have it be metabolized by ribonucleotide reductase, then I think it, it still stands as an, a valid antiviral, maybe not for SARS-CoV-2 with the protease inhibitor that's gonna be even more potent. But if you're in a place where you, you think you have an RNA virus infection and you don't know what drug to give, this would be a perfectly valid thing to do. That, that uh, long-term cohort you talked about would probably need to be followed for decades. Yes. Yep. And is that really feasible? <laughs> and what if you find out two decades later? Yeah, well, I mean, that, if we're going to, you know, if the, I, th I just think that the people who are going to distribute this drug have a responsibility to find out its long-term effects. So whatever it takes, if they want to use it, they should be take their, on that responsibility. Nathaniel Landau, yeah. oh, yes, I, I run. Yeah, thanks for uh, explaining all this, all of that. Um, it is surprising that um, Merck has been so confident about this, the drug based on, I guess, based largely on the animal model data. So, I mean, the, the mechanism of mutagenesis will be dependent on DNA synthesis. And certainly the, the vast majority of, of cells in an adult are not doing any DNA synthesis. So I would imagine there, there is no uh, problem of mutagenesis. The problem would be in cells that are actively dividing such as the lymphocytes or I guess intestinal cells are the, are the ones that I'm aware of. So in the animal models, do they look for mutagenesis in, um, in, in lymphocytes or um, intestinal cells? I mean, would the model have, have, have detected that? So the, um, I'm not sure about the big blue mouse or rat, which is a transgenic animal. I don't know what tissue they look at. This as, there's an assay called pig A assay, which can actually be done in humans. It knocks out the glycophospho linkage um, of a marker that shows up on red blood cells. And so, uh, reticulous uh, precursors, I think, are, are the reticulocytes, um, show up with a little bit of delay out of the, uh, the bone marrow. And so you can screen them, or you can screen red blood cells, but they turn over you know, on the order of months. But the reticulocyte precursor is a shorter lived cell um, to look at. So that's, uh, I think, the most sensitive assay. Um, but even that population you know, is dividing with certain half-life in in the bone marrow, but it, it's a reasonable assay. But I go back to the problem. So, so yes, they, the assays can be focused on dividing cells. Um, but I argue that a negative result doesn't tell us what we need to know, which is what's gonna happen in 10 years. We just don't know where we are on this dose response curve. Uh, so when things show up as positive, it's like a, big red flag. But when they show up negative, especially when it is a mutagen, then I think you have to stop and, and ask about assay sensitivity and what is its predictive value long-term.